Hi. In order to look at Flexure, we need to review some of the geometric properties that are implicated in Flexure. Uh, so recall we looked at the geometric property J, or the polar moment of inertia, when we were looking at torsion. And, uh, you know, just to recap, a, a geometric property is a property that is solely um, affected by the shape of the cross section. And it's not affected by the material or other external factors. So, uh, in your textbook, geometric properties are reviewed in Appendix A of the textbook, uh, and you can go through them. They cover everything that I'm going to cover here and more. Uh, this is going to be a pretty quick, fast, uh, and furious introduction. Uh, the, the true, I guess, the, the, the strength of the properties will come out as we go through the examples and go about calculating them. Um, you know, some of them, as you will see, uh, area, uh, for example, something that you're well familiar with uh, and, you know, it's, it's almost trite to throw it in here as a geometric property, but it's an important one. So, so we do. Uh, so uh, with that, let's uh, get on about it. Uh, so here's the area. So in, in all of these or in, in many of them, when we look at them, theoretically, we'll just consider some uh, blob floating in space uh, displaced from our axis. And, and so the area is defined as the integral dA. Uh, and if you were to do that in a sum of component parts, you could change the integral sign for a summation sign and break the area into a bunch of uh, you know, identifiable bits. So the value in this slide is really recognizing that the integral of dA is the area because we're going to see that come up time and time again when we look at the other geometric properties of the cross section. Okay, so first moment of area and centroid, we're, we're going to kind of look at both on this slide. They're kind of intermixed. Uh, the first moment of area, uh, Q, uh, which is an interesting uh, cross-sectional property in that it is one of the only ones that varies with your position on the cross-section. So it is a function of Y, if you will, or, or where you are uh, along uh, the cross-section. It would be a function of x2 if it's not axisymmetric. Um, but it is the integral of y dA, and that's where it gets its name, is the first moment of area, because we know, of course, integral dA is area, and if we multiply it by its distance from the reference axis, uh, we get y dA, and the distance then is the moment arm of the area, so this becomes the first moment of area. Now, Q is used primarily when we're looking at uh, shear stresses and shear strains uh, and shear flow. Um, and, and we'll see it when uh, it comes time to calculate it. We'll also look at it for regular cross sections. Now, we know, so by definition, if you will, the uh, distance to the centroid, uh, the centroid itself being the geometric center of the area, uh, is given by y bar is equal to the integral of y dA divided by the integral of dA. And, and so you should be recognizing some parts in there, but for now, uh, we can identify or bring these two together to see that Q is equal to y bar times the integral of dA. And that also means that y bar, or our distance from our reference plane to um, the, the centroid would be equal to Q divided by A, uh, which would bring us to our definition of Y bar. Now, this is where it gets useful as we get down to how do we calculate our distance from our reference plane to the centroid. In most of our cases, we're going to be dealing with axisymmetric uh, cross sections, and, and so the reality is, is we'll probably only be calculating one height, you know, y bar. Uh, but if you had to, you could do y bar and x bar. But what we see is it is the first moment of area on the top, which is to say the sum of the distance to an identifiable area multiplied by that area. Uh, all divided by, and then the area on the bottom, or the total area on the bottom. So it, um, in as much as most of our cross sections are composites of identifiable smaller sections, a lot of rectangles and whatnot, that we can break it down into those little bits, 
And so in the, in the numerator then, what we get is, again, the sum of the distance to that identifiable bit multiplied by the area of the identifiable bit. Uh, and you sum all of those up for all of the identifiable bits, and then you divide it through by the total area. And that will tell you the distance from your reference plane to the centroid. So uh, just a, a comment, uh, a little bit about uh, symmetry and, and axes of symmetry. So, you know, if we look at the C channel on the left, we see that that is axis symmetric. So, so it's got a single uh, plane of symmetry, in this case, the horizontal plane or the x-axis. And so what we know about that is that the centroid itself would be somewhere on that axis, on the x-axis, although we don't know where. And so in this case, you'd be concerned about figuring out what x bar was, uh, and then you could identify where the centroid is. In the I-beam in the middle, uh, what we have is uh, it's symmetric both in both directions. It's doubly symmetric. And so we know that the centroid will be both, you know, uh, on the intersection of the symmetry of the plane. Now, now finally, the last section that we see, kind of a Z section, if you will, is... Uh, symmetric about a point and when we have something that is symmetric about a point we know that the centroid is at that point of symmetry so now let's get a little bit more practical we're going to start looking at some regular cross sections and see how we would uh, either calculate or be able to apply the theory that we've been looking at to those regular cross sections and we're going to start with the first moment of area and so I start with the definition of it up here. So Q at X is by definition equal to the integral of Y dA or the first moment of area. And we're going to be looking at it for a rectangular cross section uh, with B and height H. Now, as we said before, Q is unique uh, in the um, cross sectional properties in that it varies depending on where it is in the cross section. So, so, so depending on where it is in height or in, in the cross section, we will get a different value of Q. Uh, and that would be true too uh, laterally or where it is in X if we were bending about the other axis. So let's look at it here. What we do is we, first off, we put in our planes of symmetry uh, and we see that we have a centroidal axis, XX, uh, uh, distance h over 2 down from the top as you would expect and what we want to do is we want to choose some arbitrary plane that we're going to calculate q for so in this case we're going to calculate q at, for q at y if you will so so at that interface between the dark blue section and the rest of the lighter blue uh, beam and, and you before I go on, the one thing I want to point out is you have to consider all of the cross section above or below the plane of interest, right? It is the plane of interest that you're interested in. Uh, and you will get the same answer uh, regardless of whether you consider everything above or everything below. Uh, and uh, it, do it doesn't matter which way you go. So let let's break it down then. So we see uh, y in this case, so the integral of y dA so if we look at our situation here, the distance y is the distance to the centroid of the area above or the area below. We're gonna consider the area above, so I'm not gonna keep harping on that. So the distance d is analogous to y in our formula. And our integral of dA then would be equal to our width b multiplied by the area which is our h over 2 minus y. And thus we get a formula for q at a plane y uh, in the cross section equal to db times h over 2 minus y. So we can further simplify this. So if I look at d and I make a formula for d in y, we can see that d is equal to our height y plus h over 2 minus y. Remember, that was the height of the dark blue section divided by 2. And so when we add that to y, we get d. And if I substitute that in, I can simplify my equation to be just a function of our constants b and h uh, and y. Uh, 
And this becomes interesting because I'm able to plot it over the height. Remember the Q is changing uh, as we change our distance Y. And so it is helpful to understand how that changes with our uh, value of Y. And plotted here, we see that it's a maximum in the center. And from the formula, it's fairly easy to see that that maximum, if Y was equal to zero, uh, would be BH squared over eight. And then as Y increases until it gets to its maximum of H over two, then Q would be a, a value of zero at the extreme fibers at the top and the bottom. And so this is really useful to us. And we'll see that as we look at shear stresses uh, resulting from bending, that this relationship of where Q is a maximum and where Q goes to zero becomes really important to understand how shear stresses are affecting our beam. So the second moment of area, one that we use probably one of the most, uh, otherwise referred to as the moment of inertia, it is represented by the variable I. And it is, you know, if you want to think about it, it is the geometric's contribution to the resistance of bending and referred to as a second moment of area. And so depending on which axis you're bending about, I sub X, or, or sorry, the X axis or the Y axis, you would either use your resistance to bending about the X axis or your resistance to bending about the Y axis, i.e. your I sub X or your I sub Y. So we said it was the second moment of area. So if you look at the formulas on the screen, we see the integral. So I'll just stick with I sub X. Uh, is the integral of y squared dA, and that's where the name comes from. Remember, Q was the first moment of area, was the integral of y dA. So it was the area multiplied by its moment arm. Well, here what we see is it's the area multiplied by its moment arm multiplied by its moment arm, and so it comes up with this term, the second moment of area. So we're going to use I to calculate the stresses, and the normal stresses in this case, over the cross section of a member uh, in bending or flexure. Uh, so it is by definition uh, calculated about the neutral axis of a cross section. And the neutral axis is, is, is synonymous with the axis passing through the centroid. We're actually gonna prove that later. So it seems like we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit by saying that, but uh, it, let, let, let's just go with it for now and prove it later that the neutral axis is synonymous with the axis passing through the centroid of the cross-section area perpendicular to the axis of symmetry. So how does this calculate out? Let's look at a rectangular section and see what it means to us. So we'll, we'll stick with our standard rectangle, uh, you know, so a width of B and a height of H. So if this was a two by six standing on its end, it would, you know, have a, a width of one and a half inches and a height of five and a half inches. Yeah, two by six. Don't get me started. Uh, dress, the, dress down so you lose a half an inch. Um, and, and, and so we have our, rectang our rectangular cross section. We'll introduce our formula then. We're going to do uh, the moment of inertia about the X uh, axis is equal to Y squared dA. And as we said before, the moment of inertia is by definition calculated about the neutral axis. So let's take a little slice dy, uh, a height y uh, from the neutral axis, and we'll show it there. And so the centroid of this section is at the intersection of the two axis of symmetry. We knew that. Uh, so we're, we're going to work from that. And that means that we have to integrate from minus h over 2, or half the height down, to h over 2, half the height up. Uh, y squared, and now we can replace dA by the width, which is constant b, and use dy. So b dy is equal to dA. And that's going to, when, when we do the algebra on that, we're going to come up with uh, the value of the moment of inertia for this cross-section about its neutral axis is equal to bh cubed over 12. And similarly, if we were to look at it in the other uh, axis, so the bending about the y-axis, or sideways bending, uh, we would get hb cubed over 12. So I'm going to back up here a little bit, ignore that, and say, okay, what does this mean to us? How, how is this going to affect our thinking? And so we'll go back to our two by six, 
Uh, so we have our wooden plank and we've got a ditch running with water and we want to walk across that ditch. So you get a choice. You can either stand the two by six up and try to walk across the skinny edge, or you can lie it down and lay it flat and walk across the fat part. Now, it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand that laying it down flat and walking across it is gonna be a lot easier to balance on. But then you have to ask yourself, where am I gonna get the most strength? And so let's look in the formula and dig out the formula and say, okay, where is this going to provide me the greatest capacity? Because remember, we said the moment of inertia is the core contribution of the cross section. It's geometry, it's geometry to the resistance of bending. So the bigger this value, the bigger the I, the greater the resistance to bending that we're going to get. So are we going to get a greater resistance to bending if we lay it down or if we stand it up? And the answer is in the cubed part of the H. If we want to take advantage of the opportunity, if we lay it down, the short value, the, the two of the two by six is cubed and the large value is not. And if we stand it up, the longer value, the, the, the six is cubed and the shorter one is not. So it is fairly easy to see that we're gonna get a much bigger value if we stand this up on its skinny end and a much greater resistance to bending. Now, this is fairly intuitive for most of us because we've most of us are familiar with framing in our house. We go into the basement or, or whatever, we look up in the roof and we can see the, the floor stringers all laid out uh, and they're all, always vertical, right? They're, they're always standing on their end because that gives the greatest contribution to the stiffness of the floor by increasing the moment of inertia. And the reason why it does that is because of this formula, because it's optimizing the use of that cubed on the H value. And, and so how does the floor then make up for the shortfall of having the skinny end up? Of course, you put floor sheathing on it, you put some plywood on top, and so it gives you lots of uh, floor space to balance on, but it gets you the strength of the uh, floor stringer standing up on, on its uh, stiff end. So when we calculated the moment of inertia, we calculated it about the neutral axis of its own cross section for that regular area, the rectangle. Uh, but most of the cross sections that we use are a composite of regular cross sections. So if you think of a T-beam, for example, you have a flange, a rectangle lying down on its uh, flat uh, at the top, and then you're going to have a, a vertical rectangle for the web. And so this is very typical of structural cross sections or structural members is that they are this composite of simple areas that are put together uh, to make the cross section. And so to be able to understand the contribution of each of those sub components, we need the parallel axis theorem. So in this case, our uh, component is displaced from our reference plane. So if we're doing it about its own uh, axis, uh, that would be easy enough. We did that on the previous slide. But in this case, the neutral axis of our composite section is displaced from the neutral axis of our component. You know, so if you think of a, an I-beam or something like that, and you're looking at the contribution of the flange, the neutral axis of the flange component itself is displaced from the neutral axis of the composite section. So that's kind of where we're going with this. So we have our neutral axis or our reference plane down at, at the x-axis, we're some distance d sub y from the neutral axis of our uh, component uh, section. Uh, that's the x prime axis is in this diagram. And so i sub x is equal to the integral of y squared dA. And so what we have to substitute for y in this case is not just y prime, but y prime plus the distance from the neutral axis of the composite section. And, and in doing that and, and working it out, we'll be able to understand the contribution of this component part to the value of the moment of inertia for the composite section.
And, and so let's follow it out. So we have y prime plus dy all squared. Uh, so let's multiply that out. We get dy squared plus 2dy y prime plus y prime squared. Uh, and then we're going to uh, break those out into the different parts, uh, taking uh, the dy squared components outside the integrals because they're, they're um, uh, constant. And what we see is that the component left in the middle, it goes to zero because the middle term uh, it's being integrated about the neutral axis and so, or the centroidal axis. And, and so it goes off to zero. So we end up with two different bits. Uh, the last bit, which is the first bit of our equation down at the bottom, is, as we see, the moment of inertia about its own axis. So this is the moment of inertia of this blob about the x prime axis. And then to understand its contribution about a displaced axis, we have this AD, uh, ADY squared term. So that's the area of uh, our component plus the distance from its centroidal axis to the composite centroidal axis, all squared. And this is the parallel axis theorem. And, and to summarize that, what we have is the contribution to the moment of inertia about the x-axis, which is the centroid, which is the neutral axis of our composite section, is equal to the moment of inertia about its own axis, plus its area times its distance between its centroidal axis and the neutral axis of the composite section, all squared. So this is somewhat interesting. So we talked a little bit about optimizing our H because it was cubed in the BH cubed over 12 of the rectangular section on the previous slide. The one thing we want to do is to understand that, okay, that would be contributing to I X prime uh, so what about this AD squared? So the area, okay, the area is going to calculate out to be whatever it is, and that's analogous to the amount of material in this component section. Uh, the D squared, on the other hand, uh, because it's squared, means that we're going to get a great impact for the material that is as far from the neutral axis as possible. And uh, we will demonstrate that as we go through and calculate it. But think of it uh, that this is the birth of the I-beam, right? We see I-beams in our daily life all the time because it is a highly efficient use of material. And the reason why it is a highly efficient use of material in bending is because of the parallel axis theorem and most specifically because of the D term in this formula because it is squared. And so all of the material in the flange gets the benefit of this second term of the AD squared. If we were to look at the web and say, what is its contribution to, the, uh, to this? There is no D squared term because its centroidal axis is coincident with the centroidal axis of the composite section. And so it would only have its I term about its own uh, neutral axis. So, the, the, the real value or, or the real learning uh, on how to use this effectively comes in practice. And, and so let's get started. We have a problem laid out here. So it's a classic T-beam, if you will. Uh, we have an unknown neutral axis uh, shown by the XX uh, dotted line on the screen. And so what we need to do is we need to calculate the centroid to identify where that uh, centroidal axis is and then we have to go on to calculate the moment of inertia for the t-section and to do that we're going to have to employ what we know about the moment of inertia for a rectangular cross-section but also in the context of the parallel axis theorem and so there's uh, two links uh, on the screen uh, the first one is for the calculation of the centroid the second one is for the calculation of the moment of inertia of the t-beam uh, t uh, and I invite you to follow those links and go through that line by line and look at it critically to start to build up an understanding so that we can do it for any section that we have to as we go on. Uh, much like shear force and bending moment diagrams, which we talked about, the cross-sectional properties are just one of those things that you have to calculate uh, 
in order to be able to go on to calculate the actual question being asked in, in the problem. So uh, we have to get uh, skilled at it so that we're not making mistakes uh, and we're wasting time, uh, you know, getting it done. So, so go do those problems uh, and, uh, you know, start to acquire those skills so that we're ready for the rest of the course. Now, having done that and gone through those problems, uh, you can probably appreciate a little bit better what's on the screen. Uh, so what we've created is an I-beam, which is 200 millimeters wide and 300 millimeters tall with unknown values for the width of the web or the height of the flange. So it's, it's a bit of an abstract thinking, but we, we have taken an arbitrary area and said, right, uh, 10,000 uh, millimeters squared is going to be the total area of material in this cross section. And then we proportion it either 100% in the web, in which case the height of the, the flanges would be zero and it would all be in the web. We calculate what the uh, moment of inertia would be. And, and then we go and we start to apportion a greater part of the material to the flanges and less to the web until we get to the, the somewhat abstract concept of 100% of it in the flanges and none of it in the web. Which doesn't really work because you need some material in the web to hold the flanges together, but ignore that abstract construct for a second. And, and then I, I calculate out using the moment of inertia and the... Uh, um, parallel axis theorem, I calculate out what the value for the moment of inertia would be in each of those instances. And then I come up with a, a function to describe its efficiency as in how big is that moment of inertia relative to the smallest one. And the smallest one, as we see, is when all of the material is just in the web. And so that last column on the right in yellow it comes up with that efficiency. And what we see is that the more material that we're able to put into the flanges, the greater our uh, resistance to bending. And the greater our resistance to bending, the lower the stresses are going to be, as we will see later. And, and so this is the justification for I-beams and T-beams and all of those things, is how do we optimize the material that we're going to use for resistance to bending? And as it pertains to normal stresses, which we will see, what we want to do is we want to make our I, our value of I, our moment of inertia, as big as possible. And that's where the I-beam uh, has its birth. So next problem, uh, first moment of area. So we talked about the first moment of area. It does get a little bit confusing. I appreciate when you're first uh, starting out as to how to calculate it. Uh, follow the link. I think it does a really good job. It's a very popular video uh, as far as understanding how to calculate it for a regular cross section, in this case, a T-beam. Uh, so, so go and do that. Figure out what the first moment of area is. We're going to get you to do it in two places. Uh, the first one is at the flange web interface. Think of it, if you, if you will, that you would have to design that connection so that uh, uh, the knowing what the first moment of area is at the interface becomes very important, as you'll see later. And at the neutral axis, we've already seen that Q is a maximum at the neutral axis. So it makes sense to us that we're going to want to know what Q is at the neutral axis. So, so uh, we're going to do it at those two locations, and that will be fairly common uh, as you move forward. 